Let me start with a hypothetical situation. Imagine this, you come back home from school and you're about to start your work, but suddenly your phone goes off. So what do you do? You check your texts, messaging, maybe any other social media accounts, play a YouTube video, maybe a game, and just like that, it's 9.30 and you didn't start your homework yet. Sound familiar? It doesn't seem so hypothetical now. I'm sure it's happened to all of you in the audience, and it definitely happened with increased frequency to me throughout last year. But the moment I realized that my so-called love for my phone was going overboard was one day when I forgot to bring it with me to school. Throughout the bus rides and school day, I felt frustrated that I couldn't use it, bored out of my mind, and isolated from my friends who were all communicating through social media. And I realized that I was developing some sort of connection to my phone, something that I needed to break. But, I, but what I didn't realize was the fact that I was acting significantly different while I was on social media and my phone versus while I was off of it. Let's use this metaphor. The screen is half black and half white. And while it may be a bit extreme, it accurately represents how different some people act online and offline. For me personally, I was a pretty quiet kid, borderline antisocial, definitely introverted. But online, I was a completely different person. I was able to communicate with ease and act in an organized and efficient manner. We live in a society that's immersed in technology. No matter where you are, no matter the time of day, you can find out what anybody is up to just with a simple few mouse clicks or looking at their social media feed. It's expected that with this kind of increased use of technology, that a problem as drastic as the difference of personalities will originate. A professor by the name of Bernard R. McCoy at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln found that out of the 777 college students surveyed, 90% of them admitted to using their phones 9 to 10 hours a day. 9 to 10 hours? That's about half the day. That's more than the time these kids spend sleeping. So it's expected that since they're using their phones so much to create a virtual reality, something different than the life they're living in, that the personalities in these two realities would be different as well. So the question is, do people have different personalities online and offline? Well, let's take a step back. We know that we all like communicating over the internet or social media. I do too, it's easier. But have we ever stopped to think about why this is the case? Well, for one, you can remain anonymous and stay invisible, where no one knows who you are or what you're doing. Well, except for the NSA, of course. With this kind of anonymity and invisibility, you exceed the boundaries of repercussions and consequences. So a group of psychologists looked in to find the effect. Like why do we act differently online and offline? And they came together with this theory, the online disinhibition effect. It states that while online, there's a loosening of social restrictions and inhibitions that would otherwise be normally present in face-to-face -face interactions. Basically, there's some social guidelines that you have to follow when talking to, in person to someone. And you don't have to follow these same things while you're online or using texting. Let me give you an example. A kid comes up to you in school asking for the homework. And you really only have two choices. You could say yes and give the kid his homework, or no and not give it to him. And if you say no, it makes you look like the bad person in the situation. But let's say the same exchange took place over texting or social media messaging. Well, here you can answer in a variety of ways that would not be possible face to face. While you could still say yes or no, for example, you could say that, oh, sorry, my phone died, or that you didn't see your messages. And these are things that wouldn't be possible while communicating in person. If you still find it difficult to believe, take note of these true stories that actually happened, demonstrating the online disinhibition effect. There was a person applying for a job at Cisco, and she even got the job. But when deciding whether to take the job offer or not, she went to Twitter to debate. And she infamously tweeted that she was debating taking the job with a fatty paycheck but having to endure the long commute to work and eventually hitting the work there. Well, Cisco employees found out about this, and they told her hiring manager, who promptly took away the offer from her, and tweeted back to her, we here at Cisco are well-versed in the internet. And she's far from the only one. Earlier this year, there was a daycare worker in Ohio who changed her Facebook status to read that she loved children, but working with them the whole week, especially when they were loud and annoying, just became too much to handle and she too was fired from her job. And there have been many students who have been denied admissions to colleges simply because of what they post on Facebook. 
as a recent survey showed that 80% of Facebook, uh, 80% of college admission officers use Facebook in order to recruit students. All these people are smart people, but they're being denied job opportunities, getting fired from their jobs, or losing college admissions just because of what they post. So that should definitely make you think twice before you post that status update or that next picture. So an internet psychologist by the name of John Suler really looked in depth into the online disinhibition effect to find out what caused it, what factors were a part of it. And he came up with these three, anonymity, invisibility, and start and stop communication. Anonymity and invisibility are pretty straightforward. Like I mentioned before, you can remain anonymous where no one knows who you are and invisible where no one knows what you're doing. But start and stop communication is where things get pretty interesting. Remember the earlier example about the kid who texted you for the homework? Well, this is an example of start and stop communication. You allow time to pass before responding to him. You can think of what you want to say, something that you usually aren't able to do in a face-to-face -face interaction. Additionally, you can just stop the communication right there by not responding to him. Again, you wouldn't be able to do this if you were face-to-face. -face. So now that we know that the difference of personalities is happening, what problems does it cause? Well, for one, it causes depression. How so? Because in social media, everyone posts things to be accepted by society. That's the point of social media. That's the kind of mentality it pushes. They join the bandwagon by using hashtag trends or posting certain kind of pictures just so that they fit under the social norms and will be accepted by their friends and society. And if they're not, this could lead to depression as, they, as everyone wants to be accepted by society. But more importantly, it leads to a lack of social skills. In a recent survey, it was found that 67% 67 of Americans have cell phones and use them actively, went out with friends and family, instead of communicating with the people they came out with. It's no surprise that public speaking is the number one greatest fear of Americans today, and that many people like, lack basic skills, such as eye, maintaining eye contact or communicating in a face-to-face -face interaction. Additionally, it could lead to the loss of personal identity. Like I mentioned before, how people are changing themselves, their unique personalities, is something that's special for everyone but they change it to fit in with society and fall under social norms, leading to a loss of personal identity. There was a critically acclaimed writer named Andrew Brown who once said, the internet is so big, so powerful, and so pointless that for some people it is a complete substitute for life. And he was right. Remember the college students who were using their phones about half the day? They were in essence living another life, another reality, where they could do anything, surpass judgments, without consequences or repercussions. So let's go back to the very first metaphor, the black and white slide. Remember how I said I acted differently while online and offline? Well, I had positive qualities in both these type of interactions. For example, even though I was quiet while offline, I was more determined and dedicated to my work, completing things with a more focused manner. And online, I may have been distracted, but I was able to communicate more easily with people, send emails efficiently, and stay organized. So I realized I had to communicate these qualities in order to form the best version of myself, a version of myself I was proud to be. So finally, remember, you are one in seven billion people. And as cliche as it might sound, you're all unique and special in your own way. You have unique personalities that no one else does, so why compromise them just to fit in with society and fall under social norms? Really think about what you post. Would your parents be happy with what they saw you post on social media? Think about your grandparents. Would they recognize their grandchildren just solely based on the content of your posts? So I want to leave you with a challenge. Now that we know that the difference of personalities online and offline is a problem, take a step back. Reflect on how you act online and how you act offline. Take the best qualities of both of these interactions and combine them to form a version of you that your parents would be proud of, the real unique you, the very best version of yourself. Thank you.